part two of our interview with Roland Lazenby and a special surprise guest starts right now. The Pistons are leaving the scene with 7.9 left. To that fourth. <laughs> the next are history. You can mark it down and put it in the book. <laughs> the Bulls are Eastern Conference champions. <laughs> We'll take a look around the NBA as our post-game show continues on the Bulls Radio Network. Who coach knocked it down? To that first. Great look by Scottie Pippen. Michael again cranks it out at the top. BJ for three. Come on. Dennis will unload from the corner. Got it. Nothing but net a three. It's over. The Bulls win. Paxton for three! Yeah! <laughs> Smith again blocked! Smith again blocked! To that force. <laughs> blocked by Horace! <laughs> Smith again blocked! Yeah! To that force. <laughs> Jordan on the drive, right of the lane, 18 for Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> the crowd on their face! The Bulls have 170! To that force. You know, I, I, I think you're so successful because you get to the surface. I mean, you get past the surface of it into those details that really matter that probably nobody brings up. Well, I, there are a lot of people bringing them up out there. It's it's like um, Kuzi uh, said, you know, all the things I was doing behind the back passes. Every 12-year-old kid can, that cares to can do that today. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people, but that's what you do in biography. You really try to break down the life experiences and analyze it. And uh, I sort of learned at Hunt and Peck, you know, it, and I was lucky uh, to have all those uh, mid-list contracts. And publishing, you know, you're getting paid 15, 20,000 a book to crank them out. I'd have to do five or six of them a year, and it was ins it just made for years of insane levels of work but I was happy to have all that experience to be out on the road working with these teams and I, I, I without really being aware of it I think I was living my old man's life for him because he was this guy that had a lot of ability and never got to do any of that and I think Michael living his old man's life for him and uh, I think that's the final closing argument in that father-son debate yeah. Yeah. I, I did this for you because you couldn't it's sort of it's complex mm -hmm. but uh, it hit me like a bus as I was you know as I was closing up that Jordan book and even when I was doing the interviews afterwards you know, you do the hard part about doing a biography. You spend all this time with people yes. on a subject. I mean, totally into it. Years after, you're still. You know, there are all kinds of things that you want to deal with. Michael's girlfriend wouldn't talk to me. His high school girlfriend. And after she read the book, she called me up laid out their whole story and you know that book sells and sells it's in 14 different languages right? yeah uh, but it sells in english and it's number four and a half, i mean this is four years after it came yeah. out it's number four today the audio edition and little brown is one of the oldest and best publishers in america it's been forever but i've just got to try to get them to allow me to I had all of her interview I wanted to put in, and the editor at the time wouldn't allow me to put it in, because it's a fascinating part of it. I mean, it it really hits home. That, that was his high school sweetheart, right? Yeah, yeah. he met her. Uh, she was cheerleader for a team, another team. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, she wore leg braces. She had. Uh, you know, his grandfather, great-grandfather, who was crippled, had such an impact on Michael. Dawson? Yeah. yeah. And uh, when I mentioned him to Michael down in Charlotte, a tear came down his cheek. But uh, this, you know, and Dawson had been a sharecropper, a moonshiner, and he'd fought all these years uh, with that 
and he, as he was an old man when Michael was a kid living right there in Teachy with him, you know, his leg every day, there was, he was in agony most days. And, uh, and this girl had uh, juvenile arthritis, wore leg braces, cheerleader, mm. and was a cousin of a UNC basketball recruit. Lived about 45. I got all the details. Yeah. And they, they, she was his girlfriend through the UNC championship as a freshman. Okay. And she had a total and complete view of him. What kind of light would it shed him in if, if you wrote that? A good light? Was it? A, a, a oh yeah, you know, I, we, you, you know, uh, I just sort of throw it all out there. There's stuff that makes. I've seen Michael be really shitty. I mean, I've seen him do. Uh, he he has this incredible compassion for the handicap, and he hides all of it. And there are accounts of that in the book. But it's sort of the variation on that theme and you begin to understand. She broke up with him because she could see she didn't want to, she's very religious. She did not want to compete. Once he became that, you know, that shot changed everything in UNC. Against Georgetown. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, before this interview, Roland, G and I did lots and lots and lots of research, which uh -oh. usually entails drinking beer. Yeah. But. We wanted to come up with a question you'd never been asked about Michael Jordan before, uh, and we failed. So for, uh, I don't know about so, that. So for, so for the hundred and first time, uh, could you compare and contrast uh, Michael Jordan and LeBron James? Uh, well, I, it's, in your point of view, I, I, I had to begin. I wrote a seven hundred page book on Michael. Never call him the greatest. First of all, I don't. I just don't believe that. That's up to a writer like me. And I've put a lot of time into knowing the game. I've put a lot of time into knowing the game. I've earned that. Uh, but I don't think a writer, I think that's up to, uh, they play in such different eras. Uh, I, don't, I don't compare Michael to the old guys, you know? Who's going to compare to Bill Russell coming through all that racial hatred? Didn't you say, well, the game was easier? Yes and no. I don't know. There were only 10 teams for a lot of his career, and they knew each other, battled. I don't know. And I certainly, uh, I, I'll say this. I've been day drinking with LeBron's uncle uh, at the Cedar Wings Lounge in Akron, Ohio, which is a grim little outpost, I'll tell you. But I, I put a lot of time into uh, LeBron James, and I, I am nothing but impressed. Yes. yes. And I enjoy watching him deal with a man in his 30s with all these fast young players. And, uh, I, you know, Carl uh, Malone. He's a great, great, great player. Yes. And he was, in Michael's era, he was that physical presence nobody could contend with. Right. I, I, like I say, I would love a time machine. First of all, the Boston Celtics won all those championships and never sold out their home open. So the first thing I would do is take people back to Boston Garden in the 1960s and I'd get really wealthy selling all those unsold seats in the garden because they only cost a buck a piece or something. Uh, but there, but I would also love to be able to take people in their prime and let them go at it. And you don't need me to tell you who's great. You can see the damn score. Mm, there you go. And I don't. I think it's absurd that these guys are going to live their lives grinding it out the way they do. Night after night after night, and some have some asshole like me, who has never done crap in the NBA, sit there and pronounce like I know. Right. That is the ultimate fraud, in my opinion. And I will tell you, they are both daggone great players. I did enjoy the NBA before it got rid of defense. Now, defense coming back in a different fashion, but. You see so many daggone just sprint layups where they 
they can't put a finger in, so they don't try. You just see people, and, and they still let them pound people in the post. And Tex Winter, the great benefit of my life, was being very close with Tex Winter. And as soon as this happened, he said, this is horse crap. The, you're going to have all these big, and it's just taking the big man out of the game because you can foul yeah. him like crazy. Yep. Uh, the coaches don't know how to treat, teach drop steps and, and the art. And Mike D'Antoni, he is one of the nicest guys in the world. And it looks like his team might survive. Well, I was going to ask but you. But they he... laughed at him. And Mike has been nice to me. Don't get me wrong. But his belief is that a post shot is a wasted shot. And he believes, and his, he's never won crap, but his view has come to dominate the NBA. And we, I sat there last night, they're running up and down the field, jacking up, th uh, you know, these 30, they're shooting 30 some percent. They might as well be those old two handed set shooters when the ball had seams and the gyms were dim and the ball was lopsided and they were chucking up anything. They've, they've taken a beautiful game and made it occasionally attractive. So you still keep up with it? Oh yeah, so I mean it's, it's my, it's my, uh, I, in college I teach people to, to think about their lives in terms of what is your expertise? Because that's what you get paid for. Yeah, you may major in business, but what are you going to be an expert in? And I, I, I encourage them to do this right here, to start interviewing people and getting to know everybody. So whatever field it is, they interview the best minds and become experts. Because basically, they, that's what my country has is done all these years. And that is the secret to it, making experts your colleagues. And then working hard to be at their, uh, you know, where you, you can engage them, you know. And so uh, it doesn't matter what field it is. And I've worked hard. I, I don't want to get out and if I get my knee fixed, mm -hmm. I might, I told my wife, and uh, if I get my knee fixed this fall, I might get out and start covering some games again. I still edit Lindy's Pro Basketball Magazine. Okay. I've done that for 24, 25 years. So I, I watch the game. I get angry and upset with it, but you know that's that's dangerous old fogey territory too. And so I have to counterbalance all of it. I still though I still treasure the '80s and the '90s in the NBA. Well, that that leads me to this: uh, you've got over 30 years watching the NBA, maybe more. But just when you're there in the arena, Roland, who has been the most fun player for you to watch and they don't have to be famous they could be not oh so famous. they're usually famous and they're fun to watch for a reason but i mean bird and magic i mean to sit there on press row to go from just being a guy playing in the gym over at the presbyterian church to suddenly sitting right under the basket nightly watching those celtics operate watching the lakers with magic operate in their prime and then watching the, the different dark force that the bad boy pistons were and watching how isaiah a little bitty guy was, yeah. in terms of the nba he's not that little bitty for the rest of us right but uh to watch it his incredible courage that went along with some substantial craziness and then to look at a guy like joe dumas watching all that stuff was uh there's an Elvis documentary that's been airing on HBO, and they got Tom Petty talking about Elvis there on TV in mm -hmm. like '54, and it's uh, he's playing and doing all that early Elvis stuff, and it's it's got that sort of oscilloscope kind of quality to it, uh, like you're looking at it through one of those uh, dive movie houses, Nickelodeon, uh, and and uh, Petty saying, you know. It must have been amazing to see Elvis for the first time. And I think the most precious thing, I, it's not that I saw Bird or Magic or any of those guys, but, but it was my first time seeing all of them. And, and then I got out with a new generation. I, I saw Kobe Bryant. I was there the night he scored his first NBA field goal. Uh, 
he came to the locker room and hit me with a fist bump and a, you know, all of that. And I sat with him alone in the locker room for about 40 minutes before he went out and won the slam dunk contest back in the old days. Yeah. Today, the NBA is so managed. That's the other reason I don't enjoy it. They got armies of PR people. And they, they, they hurt, and they've got, they become so popular, it's like a cattle call. It's a corporation. Thousands of media, they all got all these things, camera attachments, and mm -hmm. all these recording devices. It's, but back in the 80s and 90s, you could sit in a locker room and just talk with people, or you know, or uh, well, there was strategy involved. But well, tell us what Dennis Rodman was really like, and is he our last best hope to bring peace to North Co North Korea? I, I really like Dennis. <laughs> I met him when he was a young player. The worm. Yeah, at, at the Pistons, and I I remember watching him one night in Boston Garden, just run up. You talk about. Passion unleashed. And he played so. If you care at all about basketball, and Dennis acquired a lot of bells and whistles, all his tattoos before everybody had tattoos. But to watch him run that floor and run through walls for Chuck Daly, and Dennis was such a pure spirit right off, right out of Oklahoma. I didn't even play high school basketball. Graduated from high school at 5'8", mm. uh, you know, and uh, he and Tex, when he got to, by the time he got to the Bulls, he was a social phenomenon. <laughs> he was bankrupt, made $15 million off the court that first year in Chicago, but he and Tex, my buddy, were like grandfather and grandson, and they... And you know, Texas a conservative old fighter pilot. By then, Dennis had all the, you know, and Bill Smith, the team photographer, would go with Dennis everywhere. He had books in all the bars where all the women would would show Dennis their breasts. It was a big thing in Chicago. I mean, it was, those books are just astounding. It is hard to describe the impact. But Dennis had a lot of heartache. You know, uh, he came home and found. One of his teammates in bed with his wife. That's when he went crazy. He was with the Pistons. Okay. He ended up down in San Antonio. David Robinson, who almost went to VMI, was a second team all district kid, about 6 7 out of Haymarket, I think. Had, I don't know, 1,400 on college boards. And the only reason uh, he didn't go to VMI, the coach wouldn't come to his house, just mailed him a letter to sign. And so he's from a Navy family. His mother said, you're not going to VMI, you're going to Navy. And of course, David sprouted to 7-1. He's down in San Antonio, and I spent a lot of time down. I'm in their uh, preseason camps, and David has all this talent. There's nothing he can't do. He's a scratch golfer. He's built like this. Brilliant man. He does electronics just to keep himself amused, building all this stuff. And he... I remember interviewing him, he said, I don't know how Michael Jordan does it. But he was the opposite of passion, and David's gotten mad at me for explaining all this. He has some hostility toward me, but, you know, he would, they're in a preseason trying to get ready, trying to have a great team, and he'll ask out of drills, and you, you just can't be that guy if you're like that. And Dennis wouldn't even speak to him. Dennis had been through the Pistons. He knew what commitment was, right. and David was just didn't get it. As smart as he was, as great a person, and he's a he, there's maybe been a never a better person. Now there's some great ones that are NBA players. David's on that list, but he didn't understand what a team leader. And Michael Jordan he humiliated everybody in practice. He was, I mean, you you get humiliated. And it, you, it was a fight to save a shred, a shred of your human dignity. Because he was going to take it. And he punched Steve Kerr one time. Yeah, but I, was, I mean, he punched. In practice. I mean, he was going to whip your ass. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I played down at the Y. I remember an old lineman used to come in and played uh, at Bluefield State. 
and this guy would drink a six pack or two and come into the Y at lunchtime. He ran, and he, by then, he was lineman. He was, this guy was about 6'4". He was built like that wall right there. And and fortunately, I was Caucasian, because he would target these young black guys and run down the floor and just knock the living crap out of them. And then set up and score and head back down the other end and glower at everybody. And he, he came in and threw down a funk that nobody was like, and you were either going to get toe-to-toe -to -toe with him or you're going to let him have his way. And, you know, anybody in that situation is going to check your insurance policies first and everything else. And Well, well the drive that you were saying that Jordan had, that Rodden had, that David Robinson didn't have, does drive come from that hard upbringing, you think, that just... No, Maybe. no, you can take a guy like Kobe Bryant's the son of a millionaire. Now, his family got in financial trouble. Yep. But, um, I, I, you know, Michael had had a comfortable living. It's not like he came out of poverty. Mostly what I see from poverty is that I, I taught a, a Peabody and the OT program right out of VMI. I, I mean, I was with all the kids coming out of corrections. They wouldn't even allow them in Peabody. Peabody is is the armpit or was the armpit of Virginia. It was hardcore. And I had never seen poverty do anything for anybody. Mm -hmm. Now there are stories, Larry Bird's sort of the son of the town drunk who was a Korean War veteran who obviously had horrible cases of PTSD. Isaiah came out of the ghetto. You can you can find various narratives. The big improvement in LeBron's early life was that he got to live in public housing because he really didn't have any of it. And uh, when he's 12 years old, they got a spot in public housing. That was like he had been flown to Disneyland. Right. It was, and so I don't recommend poverty as a breeding ground for much of anything except heartache. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, everybody has challenges. Yeah. I don't care where you live. That's why all these people got all that money in Hollywood. They're all miserable. They got their challenges, too. And I like Steve Kerr a lot. Yeah. Steve has been great to me. Uh, Steph's from, his people are from Radford. Uh, I've written a lot of, about that. So Dale's he's got lots tech. of roots in the Oh, New yeah. River he grew up in the New River. I interviewed the people that... He was living in Blacksburg as a little four-year-old shooting on the plastic goal in the driveway. And the guy and his family next door, I, I did a story for Vice Sports on that. Uh, and, on that. and Dale, his daddy used to run a summer camp with Paige Moyer at Roanoke College. Do you, right, do you right. have any Paige, sense? Paige of, was in my study hall when I was a teacher and coach. Uh, about to, do you have any sense sophomore. if Steph attended in the background, some of those summer camps with his oh, Of dad? course, he was there all the time. Wow. No, he, he's got a deep history in this part. So if you're a Roanoke, New River Valley homer, you're yeah. a Golden State kind of guy. There's Paige now. And I was talking about, you know, Steph, and they were saying, was he really here? I said, are you kidding? Like seven straight years. Yeah. Steph would come up with Dale? Well, he's five years old older. He came to camp. He stayed in Crawford Hall, the worst old middle college has. Like three straight summers where Dell, Stefan, and Seth were all in that room. Now, did Steph come out and play around on oh, the he's court? He was a camper. He was a camper? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. See, he, I came back and worked it. His the year after Davidson, after he had a really big year at Davidson, he came and spent both weeks at my summer camp this summer. And then after his first year in the NBA, he came through for a day. So he was great about coming back. When he was a kid, Paige, did you see anything special in him at that stage? You know, he, was, he was always real skilled. He was that skilled and good. The thing people forget about him, he didn't reach puberty until he was in high school. Right. And he grew so late. Yeah. And he blew up. At the end of his junior year, the next five months, and that's when Greenberg, actually, he, he takes a lot of heat. And he's not a friendly guy, but he, he did try to come back and recruit once he saw how much he grew that summer. But he went from being a really good high school player to like a very solid player from maybe Southern Conference School. Your perspective made my vice story yeah. on that, if you remember. Yeah. Right. And then in August, uh, we have a camp down there. I've done for since 1993 with Dell. And uh, 
Usually two or three NBA guys are there to play. The guys from UFC show up for the open discussion is killing everybody. And I called Rick Hall, who was the director of basketball operations for Greenberg. I went to high school. Yeah. And I said, you better tell Greenberg to get down here. I said, the boys are screwed up. He yeah. said, it's unbelievable the difference of him in these five months. And that's when he really kind of grew and became what he is. By that time, Davidson already pretty much locked it down. How neat is it, it that out the NBA MVP two times? Yeah. Is a Davidson College yeah. graduate. Yeah. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Uh, we have a friend of a show uh, called Bronco, and uh, he, he he knew we were going to interview you, and he sent us a little question he'd like to ask. Good. I'm he slid it under the studio door, so I'm to speak. honored. Um, if there is such a character. <laughs> there is. There is. Dear Roland, I'm kind of a big UVA basketball fan. Tell us the inside story of Michael Jordan's flirtation with UVA after high school and how close he came to becoming a teammate of Ralph Sampson and conquering the basketball universe. Well, you have to understand that everybody in Wilmington thought there's no way that Michael would end up starting or ever getting off the bench at Carolina. And Michael himself did not believe that. And so he began looking around as, you know, because he was late to the game. Yeah. This was all uh, really heating up after his junior year. You know, he came into the camps. He wasn't even listed in the summer magazine, basketball magazines, as one of the top 500 players in America. I mean, he was not anywhere on us and he blew up at the five-star camp wow. and he got in the five-star camp because Roy Williams the graduate assistant at UVA sort of defied Dean Smith but they wanted to look at him against better talent and he went up there and had the, he just blew up the world he was it was just like Howard Garfinkel the five-star guru said you know you have that moment when you and he was in his office looking through the glass windows and caught sight of Michael. He was going, oh my God. So nobody knew who Michael was. And Michael knew that he was being, I mean, he was being recruited. And so he wrote, sat down and wrote a letter personally. He figured his best chance was to go to UVA. Michael did. Yes, he wrote a letter oh. to Terry. Holland? to Terry Holland, the coach at UVA, oh. and said that he wanted to come up there and play with Ralph and be on their team. And Terry admi admitted all this in an interview with me. Uh, and he, Terry, had, if you recall, had such a mania about Dean Smith in Carolina. That was the, the, the big evil presence in the ACC to him that controlled everything. And Terry was recruiting Chris Mullen yep. and, and the other kid that was um, Tim Mullen. He had a couple of two guards. I think it was Tim Mullen, the guy who started at two guard for UVA okay. during the Samson era, a kid from New York. So he had these two kids. And so he mentioned it to his assistant coaches, but he said, I don't want to lose Chris Mullen recruiting Michael. Mm. And so they declined. He said, Dean Smith's going to get him anyway. Mm. Mm. And they didn't get Chris Mullen anyway at UVA, Oh, no, did no. So they got Tim Mullen, who, you know, was a, a, a so-so college player. But uh, Michael wanted to go. Now, could they have gone down there and closed that deal? I know this. I'd have tried. I'd have been down there. I'd have gone down to his house immediately, knocked on the door and said, here's a letter. You going to sign with us? Can you imagine Ralph Sampson with Michael Jordan for two years? And Leave us with this, Roland. Uh, where does Rondo? Ronnie Anderson fit into the top five of all time. Of all time. Uh, the real Rondo or my buddy Ron uh, Anderson? Is, well, is, Ron is real or, Ron or the Ron figment Ron of Ron's his imagination? One. He's number one. Hmm. He's number one. Okay. He is. And I've met some wonderful people. 
playing pickup basketball. Well, but Ron is number one. We'll, we'll certainly not put that in the interview because we'll never hear the interview. That's end of definitely that. got to be but, edited but, out. But you yeah, know we'll, how good a guy he is. He's a great guy. And he's, he's a heck a of a guy. player. You're yeah. such a sage, Roland. Thank you I'm so much for sage. being on the show. <laughs> no, sage. Uh, we could go on for hours talking. I might to be you. a sausage. I'm not a sage. <laughs> <laughs> and a special thanks to our mutual friend, Rondo Anderson, too, yeah. for bringing us together. We know Rondo himself is a heck of a player. Yeah, we do. I, I like Rondo a lot. And we, we just enjoy this. We hope to have you back someday. Yeah, I'm talking about the real Rondo. I hope to be back, oh, guys. That's fun. Yeah, that was fun. Inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Good! The Bulls win it! They win it! Set the Cleveland Cavaliers. Michael Jordan hits it at the foul line. 1 to 100. 20,273 in stunned silence here in the Coliseum. Michael Jordan with 44 points in a game. Hit the shot over Craig Elo. What tremendous heroics we have had in game five.